Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Bloom Conversations. I'm Claire Dewhurst. I'm the director of City Nation Place, which is the global forum for place branding and place marketing. I'm honoured that Bloom Consulting has invited me to join these podcast sessions just to introduce the discussions. I see my job as asking the questions on behalf of you to ensure that we learn the most from the Bloom experts and their guest speakers. This podcast series has been launched to celebrate Bloom's 20th anniversary, Happy Birthday Bloom. And throughout the series, we'll be diving into the world of nation branding and place branding. In each episode, we'll be looking at just one thing you could focus on to improve your nation or place brand strategy. In fact, in each episode, we'll be focusing on one of the 14 steps that Bloom have identified as being crucial to building an effective strategy. So just one thing today and 14 things over the series of conversations. Today's conversation is about the first step, laying a strong foundation for your strategy. And I'm joined by Bloom Consulting CEO, Jose Torres, and also by Christian Biller, who's the brand strategist with the Swedish Institute. That's the organization responsible for communicating and promoting Sweden's nation brand to an international audience. So welcome, welcome to you both. Jose, let's start by asking you why this first step, building a foundation, is so important. I mean, I can see that it feels like an obvious starting point. What do you mean by a strong foundation? Well, Claire, thank you so much for the congratulations. <laughs> it actually has been 20 years. It has been quite a ride. And over the past 20 years, I've had the privilege of working with many countries, many nations. Some projects were successful, others were not. And the, really the important thing here is, you know, the lessons learned and what were the things that experience taught us. And it's very interesting to see that such a basic aspect that sounds like something that is a must have sometimes is not there yet in some projects and some nations. We see a lot of the nation branding projects being born without a strong foundation, without having an alignment with all the stakeholders. And that is, that compromises the entire nation brand strategy. That compromises the implementation of the nation brand strategy. It's probably one of the most important steps, I would say. Uh, and uh, like I said, a lot of times is overlooked. And in the end, nations and nation brand projects or even city brand projects fail because of that. So that is why we have outlined the step one. And I think it was really fascinating to invite Christian to talk about the foundations because I think that is a really an admirable step one that uh, Sweden has on managing their nation brand. But I, I'm going to leave uh, it to him to talk about this, which is really fascinating. And, and we have so much to learn. And I hope many nations learn from this as well, because it really helps to implement the successful nation brand strategy. Great. Thanks. I love the fact that you're, you're saying if you don't, you, you're focusing more on when it goes wrong. And I, I assume that as we go through this conversation, you're going to focus on how to get it right. But let's turn to you, Christian. You've been with the Swedish Institute for 16 years. And, and as Jose said, the nation brand of Sweden, anyway, from my outsider's perspective, appears to be strong and steady and consistent in its messaging and its reputation management. Can you remember back to when the foundations were first set? When, when was the Institute established? What was your original remit? Well, the Institute, to go back many years, it was established back in 1945, actually. As many, I think, organizations working with public diplomacy were during the last year of the Second World War. And it was really Sweden's effort to enhance their relationship with the world. We are similar to other agencies like to get the Institute or the British Council and to build trust for Sweden internationally, really. But it all started, I think, back in the 90s, really, after like a financial crisis in Sweden. And the Swedish government established this organization called the Council for the Promotion of Sweden. And really to synchronize Sweden's promotional activities that we wanted to sound like one voice. So from the get go, the Swedish government decided to have some of the most important stakeholders with the task of promoting Sweden abroad on this project. So it consists of six different actors. It's three departments in the Swedish government. It's the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. The Minister of Enterprise and the Minister of Culture together with us, the Swedish Institute, which has this public diplomacy objective and also business Sweden to promote Sweden as an export and investment country and visit Sweden. 
So this council together has the objective to give the Swedish government advice on how to promote Sweden abroad. And, and going back to like two decades, there was a first really substantial study on, on the image of Sweden abroad. And the insight from that study that the image of Sweden abroad was strong and positive, but the strategic challenge was that the image of Sweden we would perceive was outdated, was still ABBA, Bjorn Borg, um, social democracy and so on and so forth. It's a stereotypical view of Sweden. And we wanted to tell the story about contemporary Sweden. The council decided to have this joint communication platform and launched that in 2007 based on the core principle that we want to be perceived as a progressive country, a country that talks about contemporary Sweden and sort of the story where of reading headed instead of talking about the past. So that's pretty much the base of the strategy and that sort of foundation, that base is still around. So we have that idea in our communication and marketing and, and so on and so forth work, communicating Sweden as that country. That's fascinating. Thank you. And I could see that that will resonate with many nations and cities and other places that if you don't do anything to manage your reputation, the external view will become stereotyped because you haven't elevated the stories of what's happening now. So I can see that that would apply to a lot of people. Do you find that you do need to keep asking questions about what you're there for and what you're delivering? Well, I think you always have to ask that question because the challenges are always like changing around, right? So you have to ask yourself that question, you know? Why are we doing this? What are the challenges that we're actually facing? Because the challenge back then might be, okay, the image is outdated. Is that still the case for us? I'm not sure, actually. I don't mm -hmm. think the image is that outdated. I think we face other challenges, both as a country, but also as a global, of course. The, the strategy is always by nature an ongoing process. So you have to reevaluate your strategy. And to have that sort of in line, of course, with the country and the policy and so on and so forth. So yes, that, that, that is both a challenge, but I think it's a must. I have actually a question for you. When, when we talk about, you know, the, the other stakeholders, the, the six permanent members, I mean, so the, it, there is a clear mandate of who does what, right? And, and yeah. I assume, right? So you, do you meet on a, on a regular basis? Do you have kind of a, a governance system? Can you talk to us a little bit more about this? I think this is fascinating. Sure. So we have like three different setups. So we have like on the top level, you have the strategic level that meets four times per year. So sort of presidents, direct generals, head of units and so on and so forth. That sort of sets the strategic foundation. Then now we have a more of a tactical set up underneath that who are really in charge of operative assignments. So they meet also around four times a year to discuss more of the tactical approaches of okay, who are doing what and so on and so forth. And then we have an operational level also, and that constitutes of two different teams, really one on monitoring the image of Sweden, all the different organizations of course monitor their subject. And then we have one on the visual identity also. So that's the three levels in the organization that we meet regularly. That's not much of, of a budget here. I think it's just 500,000 kroners, which is about 50,000 euro annually for different initiatives for the council. But otherwise, of course, it's each organization's providing the different things that you need to do. So that's, that's a setup. But of course, also the other big question is the, is the funding, right? It, it comes from the foundation part. Is this something that is clear as well from an annual basis perspective? Because sometimes we see around the world, okay, there's a fund for one year, for two years, but then what happens every year? So it's a conversation that compromises the foundation and compromises the execution, right? Do you have this clearly outlined as well, or how does it work? Well, each organization, if you take us and visit Sweden and visit Sweden, are three different organizations actually were set up differently. But we still get all the cues from the Swedish government. So we have an instruction that doesn't really change year to year. So we have our tasks. As you said, the Swedish government do give yearly sort of recommendations of what to focus on. And of course, that follows up with the budget that we receive yearly. I mean, we've all been around for many, many years, all the organizations. So it's not a specific like brand 
Sweden organization that is set up. So it's more of a corporation. You cooperate. You have all the same tasks to promote Sweden, but with different sectors, of course. But so the mandate really comes from the sector specific mandate that you have and the budget you have from that. But, but of course you need to cooperate because you do have also same objectives that you want to uh, reach. And that is of course to, to promote Sweden and it has worked for us. One of the things that we also recommend a lot to nations is to have kind of an, an advisory board that provides support to the committee or to the entity that is in charge of, of or has a specific mandate. Do you also work with external advisory boards from private sector, academia, and so on? Is it something that you also contemplate, even if it's an, in, an informal way? Not on the council's level, if you look at the council for the promotion, there's not that sort of support from other actors, but for each organization, of course we do have, and if you look at the Swedish Institute, we have sort of a council that helps, especially in the director general and her staff to help her to attack or, or understand different topics. So absolutely from academia, from private sector, from other governmental organizations and so on and so forth. So each organization has that board. But there's not a board for the country branding or call the council that it happens within each organization in Sweden. I was going to come back to you, Jose, because, you know, it's great to hear how the Swedish Institute is, is structured for us. Yeah, as we've acknowledged, not every place has that same structure. So what do you think are the principles of that foundational structure that can apply to any shape government or any place, basically? That's a very important question. And one of the things we have to see is that this change from geography to geography, from country to country, from, from government to government. And one of the things that is really important is to try not to make this a, a political you know, it's a state project. It's not really a, a government project, right? So, so how to separate the, um, the, the, the whole conversation of it was built by a specific political party. So I think this is one of the most important things that whatever the setting is, this needs to be taken in consideration that the foundation stays away at the most, uh, the further way as possible from any political associations. The ones that work best are the ones that have no associations whatsoever. But then I guess, you know, inevitably political policies have an impact on the external perceptions of the country. So, and I was going to come back to Christian and ask about that because we're living in this period of intense turmoil and change. And I was reading an article recently in the Financial Times about this creating an identity crisis in Sweden because Sweden has has been known for its long-term commitment to neutrality and to free trade and to, you know, the progressive brands that you mentioned earlier. So you know, given all of that, how is that challenging your work in the Swedish Institute? That's a very interesting question and a very difficult one to answer quickly, but, but these are challenging for Sweden and we face them as long as many countries do. And these issues like strategic autonomy and de-risking, of course, Russia's invasion of Ukraine, and there's so many intricate strategic challenges that are at play right now, right? And of course, not to mention the green transition and AI and all of that. So yes, we live in a turmoil period, but, but in my view, I think a successful sort of foundation for a nation brand is achieved when you can have some harmony between the image, its identity, and its profile. And if you look at the image of Sweden abroad, I think the image is pretty robust. So for the reputation of Sweden being well-governed and trustworthy and internationally engaged and sustainable and so on and so forth, it's sort of all backed up with values, I mean, such as transparency and democracy and creativity and so on and so forth. I mean, these brand assets are still very valuable, I think. But if you take the issue of neutrality and non-alignment and Sweden's joining NATO or bid to joining NATO, I mean, we did turn on a dime here together with Finland. And I think we had to make a choice there. If we wanted the choice being still being neutral or non-aligned or just have a world run by rules, I think neutrality had to go. And, and, and we can see that uh, there's a very strong backing here of, from the Swedish population of, of wanting to join NATO, but, but 
I think that the most difficult issue for us maybe is the self-image, which is very interesting to, to discuss. I mean, facing all these complex challenges that we are, do we have the capabilities to tackle them? We have to sort of tackle them efficiently too. So if we don't, I think there will be more of a negative sentiment among Swedes. And that might have the potential to cause this dissonance. So if we don't live up to sort of the brand promise of being that country, we turn into something else, being sort of more inward looking or nostalgic or so on. That might be a problem. I don't, I don't really see that forecast, but, but it, I mean, that, that is a risk. But for us, from the Swedish Institute perspective, I think we, the objective is still the same to communicate Sweden being forward-looking, democratic, innovative, and so on and so forth, is still the way forward for us. So we haven't really changed. I think there's still enough harmony for us to communicate that. But, but I think that is something that we have to follow closely. And we do follow closely. That changes. So we've asked you lots of questions, Christian. Do you have any questions for Jose around this first step? In, in building an effective nation brand strategy. Do you have any questions for him on what he sees to be the necessary components of a firm foundation? Well, it is interesting, of course, to discuss the setup. First of all, I mean, to discuss the question of why, start with what are the actual challenges that you want to face by building this sort of organization or working with your nation brand. To be strategic, you have to, to understand what challenges you're facing and, and focus on that. So that might be one question, his experience on that. And of course, his experience in just getting stakeholders in the same room and building that organization, what's your best practice? From what I've learned from all these years, there is not one size fits all. There's not a common strategy for every country, even on the foundations. If you go to different parts of the world and start talking about the different institutions that they need to have a dialogue, they don't want to have a dialogue on purpose. They don't want to have a dialogue. They, they see themselves as competing with each other. So how do you manage that? So sometimes we feel like we are like the United Nations and trying to get everyone at least somehow aligned and somehow compromise and really understand the greater cause. How, how do we do that? This may sound very basic, but we do that with data. So we explain to, to nations what is the benefit and, and how, if you work together in an, an aligned way, like you do, which is the envy of those many nations and cities, it is something that for you, it may be obvious, like I just said, but for other nations, they don't see that, that as always, because it's not that they don't think it's not better, it's that they think it, it won't work or they think there's no point in it or that there's no benefit in it. And they always give the example, oh yeah, that's always Sweden and the Scandinavians and the, you know, the Nordics, those ones there, those are the exception to the norm. And, you know, we have our own challenges here and so on that this would not apply. And it's true, it cannot be exactly the same thing, but we back up always the information. We try to show if they work on a nation brand, if they work on, on and by nation brand, I don't mean by simply nation marketing, but, but explaining that, the benefits of having a positive perception, the benefits of having a positive reputation, and more than anything, that it's possible to do it and to manage it, which is also, there's this question about, can I manage, can I control my international perception? And the answer to that is yes, of course, you're not in full control because that's impossible to control what others think about you, but at least you have a say into that conversation. That's what this is all about. It's not about, you cannot control it, but you can take part in that conversation. And so when we show this with data and when we try to explain the benefit it has to society from an economic point of view, from a social point of view, from a public diplomacy point of view, that is how you open the conversations and explaining this with data. Once you do that, then it changes completely. It's a completely different conversation. Then you're having a conversation that is based on the how to, but not the why. So my recommendation really to, to all the nations that, that need to look into this is open that conversation with data and, and make sure that you have the right stakeholders on board from the get-go. We classify them into brand architects and brand builders. So the brand architects are the ones about the foundation and the brand builders are the ones that execute the brand. Sometimes, the, for instance, you, Christian, can probably be two. <laughs> the two, you have the two hats. 
you are an architect and the builder, but it's really about how to have the right brand architects from the get-go and really do the stakeholder mapping so that it supports and have the mentality of, of creating something new. And if you have them, then, you know, there's a higher chance of success and everything backed up by data. That's how I recommend the countries to, to embrace this challenge. Christian, I'm keen to understand if, if you are challenged by the, the question, right? Why are we doing this? Why is this important for Sweden? Do you have this from society, from journalists, from, you know, someone that is in a different political party? And if you do have this, how do you uh, overcome those challenges? Or what would you recommend countries or the brand builders in your position to tackle this challenge? Well, one thing, you don't want to come off as a PR agency. And um, that's one risk that you just do like different marketing PR stunts. That's a big risk. I think that you do it just to be seen. And that's all the KPIs that you have. That's all you measure. You have to do this to help Sweden succeed in the world and by having to be relevant, to communicate and market Sweden as Sweden and Swedish stakeholders wish to be communicated and marketed. So you have to listen a lot. You have to understand how Swedish companies communicate and market themselves, how they develop their products, how they want to, what type of investments do they want? What type of tourists do they want? So you are much in line with what people want to communicate. You don't want to be a propaganda machine. You don't want to be a PR agency because that doesn't really suit us. So that's the first right there. Of course you can do marketing and PR, but that's not your main objective here. Your objective is to help Swedish companies and Swedish policymakers to succeed. And in building that success, of course, building a better Swedish economy and maybe a bit cliche to help the world. I mean, that's also important. I mean that we communicate market structure that is relevant to the world. You cannot just talk about how great you are or about your own history or about yourself all the time. You have to interact. And that's one important thing maybe people missing, how much effort it takes you to actually interact with your audience. So putting your effort there, because that's where sort of the magic happens. That's where you also get the best feedback, if you're relevant or not. So if you just do PR and marketing, it might suit some sector-specific uh, objectives that you have, but for us, it doesn't really work that well. You highlighted a very important point there, which is it's about making sure that that questioning doesn't come. It's about doing that homework and really doing that immersive dialogue with agents of, of Sweden and the ones that you are serving in a way and, and really understand their needs. And so that then when everything is built with a purpose and aligned with, with what is, suits them, right? So I think that's a very interesting answer you have there in the sense of the dialogue with the agents on the ground, with the ones, with the companies, with, with the diplomats, with the diplomatic corps, it's the, really the understanding of the, the need. And, but nevertheless, you still have questioning. They're going to come and say, well, yes, it's a PR <laughs> initiative, it's a marketing initiative. And so on. So how do you, how do you overcome those? When the, the resistant ones, the ones that they say. I don't know. I don't know. It comes with the territory, I guess. I mean, people will criticize you and other countries will criticize you and so on and so forth. I mean, I think you have to live with that. You have to be sure that what you're doing are professional, that you have set up the KPIs that you can explain uh, why you're doing this. And maybe sometimes the KPIs, if you, if you measure them against like the nation brands index might not be the best KPI for you. You have to have other KPIs to help you to explain the, the value that you provide as much as you can. I mean, we're 140 people. We have this budget. I mean, that's just so much that we can do. I think it's a very interesting point the, the, about the KPI. So, and then it comes back also to the data that I was explaining. It's always coming back to the data and less about the opinion, right? And much more about facts and I'm trying to demonstrate that with a measurement and what is the performance and, and also the KPIs, at least from our experience, I don't know about you, Christian, but is really about KPIs that resonate with them. 
right? You know, there are other types of KPIs, but our job cannot influence that directly because that's a different type of, of KPI. You should not be uh, evaluated or criticized for something that it's not your responsibility, let's put it this way. Yeah. So understanding that I think is also helps a lot from the foundations, at least and that's what I hear you saying. And I completely agree with you. Thank you. I'm going to say thank you both, but it sounded to me like there's a strong connection there between that organizational foundation, the clear vision, that bigger picture and how that enables you to listen and understand what everybody wants to achieve so that you can keep evolving and keeping people on board because you've got that structure in place, which means you can keep listening to everybody as well as changing everybody's voices in what you say. Also, it's very important, the conversation about the foundations, because from my experience and what I've seen in, in many nations happening, because there's this lack of the strong foundation is the repetition of the nation brand exercise. I mean, of course, the nation brand strategy, you know, it's something that is ongoing. And I, I think, Christian, you probably will agree with me on this. It's an evolving thing that changes according to how the world changes, right? But the entire exercise of doing everything again, you see this happening in many nations. And this is because those foundations are not there. And what happens is you repeat everything again. There's a new government in place or a new stakeholder in place, and then they repeat the entire exercise and then do. So it's a repetition of strategies, that, but never being implemented. If you have a good foundation, if you have a strong foundation, this ensures there's a proper continuation. This does not mean that it should not be questioned. This does not mean that it should not be redone, but it's not because there is a new political party or there's a new political leader. It's because it had to, to be done. But, and, and, and that is really a very important thing. And we see this happening a lot of times. And the strong foundation mitigates this. Thank you, Jose. And thank you both. It's been so good to hear more about your work at the Swedish Institute, Christian. Thank you for joining us. And thank you for listening. I hope you'll be tuning in for the next episode of Bloom Conversations, where one thing at a time, we'll be exploring Bloom's 14 steps to successful nation and place branding. In the next episode, we'll be looking at the importance of understanding perception. In the meantime, on the Bloom website page where you found this podcast, you'll see our recommendations for further reading to help you in your approach to building a firm foundation for your nation or place brand strategy. 